Got it. So welcome to the third Zoom ramble. I'm in my bedroom. We've got the bed head behind me. Uh, that's what that is. I'm on Miriam's side of the bed. So all the images and the hand are hair hand and hair images. Um, yes, today I want to talk about the village of Great Milton. And this Great Milton village is a few miles from Oxford. It's really in the heart of the country, the heart of Great Britain. It's as far from the sea as you're ever going to get. Um, I went there because a timber framing pal asked for help and I went out to help him. I helped him on a couple of jobs. He worked in a yard in the area where there were different craftspeople. One of those people was a stonemason, a uh, very fancy stonemason, did lettering and everything. And he said to me, he said, Elliot, you should go and talk to the arts officer in Oxfordshire. Uh, introduce yourself. And he used the words that I forever love. He said, cream rises to the top. Well, how good is that? I went to see the arts officer, Mrs. Sally Ann Hartshorn. And she was lovely. She was fantastic. I showed her my work. We talked about it. She said, there's nothing doing at the moment, but I'll keep you in mind. So I helped my friend. That was that. Um, it was fun going to Oxfordshire. Uh, adventurous type things happened. I met people. I liked being in this very different place uh, from living in North Wales at the time being in a different country. So I get a phone call from Sally Ann Hartshorn and she's being fired by the county council. Uh, her contract is gonna be ended and she's got some budget left that she'd like to uh, finish off. And would I like to make something for a school in Great Milton? Well, of course, I don't really know what I'm saying yes to, but again, I'm very flattered that she's asking me and I say, yes, she's given me a budget, but she's not giving me the detailed project. They had had this very talented sculptor woman from Southampton come in situ at the school. She made a Japanese garden in stone and uh, she had some land art made out of the lawn um, and she'd had landscapers try and <laughs> translate her idea into um, this great hill that the kids could get on and mess about on. It wasn't a brilliant effort, but the idea was good. And there was supposed to be a pathway that connected the two things. And she had designed this pathway and she'd drawn up some sketches of a Japanese pergola and sent them to me. And I arranged to meet with her at the school so she could show me where this thing started and when it ended. Because of course, you need to know these things. Now this pathway was all curved and it was all sloping. It's like really what would normally be considered a really hard thing to build to. And because it was a big outdoor area and it would consume a lot of material, I didn't make it in green oak, which I normally would. I found a local sawmill and he was going to cut up lots of larch for me. And then funnily enough, it was going to work for my friend in Oxfordshire. We had to repair an old vernacular building from Hampshire. Um, it wasn't as glorious as a barn and it wasn't as small as a shed. So they used the word vernacular to describe it. It's a 19th century thing. And the wood there was a lot large. We took it down, took it back to my friend's yard, and we had to clean up the pieces and use whatever we could to match to new wood. And this was my introduction to how robust larch is as a wood. Normally, I would think it is just, it's a pretty good softwood. But actually, I think it's technically a hardwood and it certainly lasts a long time. It's certainly a lot more robust than it looks, especially on the surface. The surfaces get messed up, 
but the core of the wood was really good. So I ordered larch for my pergola, my Japanese pergola, also known as the pergola transformation. Now at this time, I had only worked for special schools. I had worked with an instrument maker and we'd taken our work into a whole series of special schools in Wales and England. And actually going into a special school with all your tools and all your gear uh, had become something as a nightmare. The kids would come out, they'd be interested in you, they'd be all over you. All your stuff and all your work was now going in all various directions at once. It was all completely out of control. And for us as ordinary human beings, it was a bit of a nightmare because, of course, we were responsible there somehow. Um, and that's our experience of working in education and working in schools. So the idea of working in a primary school was a bit daunting. But anyway, I did it. The school had a friend in the village of Great Milton, this old woman, Mary Overell, and she lived on her own in this house and she had room for me. So I got to stay in Mary's house in the village, uh, almost opposite, just a really short walk to the school. It was fantastic. There was a pub in the village. Uh, you could get really nice home cooked food there and a, a pint of Guinness real Guinness, not this chilled stuff they try and fob you off with in the pub. Uh, they had a place to sit outside where you could watch the world go by. I love this place. It had a village shop where you could pick up the Guardian in the morning, like civilised people that might do. I love this village. I love this place. Uh, it, had, it didn't have a lot, but it had everything you might need at the post office. I went in the school, the timber arrived when it was supposed to do. Uh, I hired gear to drill holes in the ground. Um, I had a guy help me do it. You need two people to keep this thing under control. We had a lot of holes to drill so I could get deep like I like to do, get my posts deep in the ground where they're supposed to be. And I found but this primary school is a small village school. And these schools tend to be really fantastic. Everybody knows each other. Their parents went to this school. Their grandparents might have gone to that school. It's a close, tight-knit community. And the kids, the children were really well behaved. So I never had any kind of problems that I'd had in the special schools at all. Because these, these children were far too well behaved. It was, it was worrying. Anyway, I had all my stuff there. It was not interfered with. I got on with the work. And even though the pathway was curved and it was sloping, for me as a timber framer, the whole thing was a piece of cake. We just did it with string lines, cut to string lines. I was that skilled that the whole thing was just unbelievably easy for me. And I had fun. And I had fun following the artist's drawings and improvising a little bit. I cut a cherry tree in the school that I could have the uh, wood for the main um, bow of it, main trunk of it. Um, but the bits coming off, I could recycle into the pergola. Some really nice bits. Um, I followed the, the design of the architect as faithfully as I could. And I built this tunnel transformation in this school. Uh, we got some wood chippings to lay down on the path. I got a class full of kids to come run up and down it for a few times to compact it. It's fantastic. Uh, some of the naughtier children would come and visit me uh, out of school time and they got involved in helping me. It was really fantastic because the naughty kids, they tend to be the intelligent ones, the different ones. They have skills that are not used. They are they're interested and, and they got involved. They were fantastic. Um, the whole thing was fantastic. Working in this school and making stuff in situ as an artist in residence was fantastic. And it completely opened my eyes to the possibility of you can go into a school and you can make stuff there. 
uh, it never occurred to me before. It occurred to me then because I loved it. I was there all hours. Uh, I was there long after the school shut at three o'clock or four o'clock, and they might have had evening activities. I was there. I was there until I had to get out. Uh, I was making this beautiful handmade thing, uh, really enjoying it. I had my music. I probably drove the neighbors a bit bonkers, but they didn't come over and complain. So I didn't do anything about it. I had the best time there. And at the end of the day, I could have a quick bath, get changed, go to the pub, have a lovely meal, get back to Mary's. I used to talk to Mary. She was interesting. Um, the village was interesting. She would explain to me about things. Oh, it was great. Now I've got my folio here. So I'm able to show you the ending. <laughs> I can't show you the process. I can't show you the pleasure of being in the school, but I can show you what I did, what my work was. So this is the Tunnel of Transformation. And you can see at the end, at the beginning of this thing, I'd made a what in Japanese is called a torai, and that uh, shaped beam on the top. I'd made a proper formal Japanese torai for a Japanese garden in Rexton, so I knew what they were, and I knew what they were supposed to look like. And it was a piece of cake and a bit of fun, and there it was. Here is um, showing the middle of the uh, the middle of the pergola and a doorway I'd left open, so you can access this art, uh, this pergola from the ends or from the side. Uh, I've got another photo here, uh, taken years later when the um, when all the wood had gone grey. And my beautiful finish that I'd applied wasn't there anymore. There's another view looking down on it. Now that pergola, I've been there to visit for a while. That, that pergola is still there. That larch is fantastic. That thing is so well built. It's so well put together. Um, it is an outstanding thing. It's an outstanding thing to look at, be with. And because I befriended this elderly woman, Mary Overall, um, she would let me stay. And of course, Great Milton is in the middle of the country. So it was very handy for me. If I took my work around the country, which I did, uh, I could stay with her, be in this fantastic place, go to the pub, um, check in with her. It was all, it was fantastic. I love staying with real people. Not a B and B, not the Airbnb, but somebody you can talk to, somebody not the same as you, but you talk to them. It's interesting. Um, and I could go to the pub, and then I could wander over and just hang out with the pergola until it was time for bed. What a thing! What a fantastic thing! That pergola, yeah, I can see looking at the photos that you've got this skeletal frame made by the wood. And then the sun is casting shadows of the wood all over the place. And that's changing all the time. And that's part of the magic of transformation. And yeah, I can see that now looking at it, looking at photos where you're stepping back, looking at it. Oh, it's just the most gorgeous thing. I took it for granted <laughs> that because I was so good at this and because I enjoyed being in that school, so much and i love interacting with children and engaging with them um i took it for granted that my skills would be used and i would work for schools everywhere and do this kind of thing but actually in hindsight i don't think anything that's good ever happened like that other things happened I did get to be artist in residence for a school or two. Um, I did apply myself as best I could. I made amazing things. Um, but that project happened because of the flow of it, of being sent to talk to the arts officer who was then fired, had to clear her budget, who asked me if I would do this thing 
And I said yes <laughs> before I knew what it was. Um, it all flowed. I met I met the sculpture woman there. She was a fantastic lady. We're talking about somebody who has MS, uh, is a parent, a single parent, somebody who, for whom things were not easy, uh, but she did fantastic work. She showed me that you could you could you could have all these struggles in life and still do fantastic work. I was a very blessed person. I had a fantastic body. I had a fantastic life. I was skilled. I was resourceful. I was motivated. I didn't care what anybody thought about anything. I was I was interested in what I could do, what was possible. Um, but anyway, that was a transformative moment. Making that pergola, being in that school working with those children. I loved it. I love going into a school. I was not trained or educated with a bachelor's in education. I couldn't talk the talk. I wasn't interested in the talk. When I found out about the talk, I became less interested. I could offer what I could offer. And often that was in contradiction to the, um, to the norms and the conventions and what was available to children, how children were treated, how they were regarded. In school, the school is a place for controlling children, for getting them to stay in their little box and do what they're told, to, to be in their little rows of desks and line up and this and that and the other. And I'm the opposite. I, I, I want people, I want children to be free, to express themselves, to find out what's going on in their heads, for them to be brave and truthful and to express themselves. Uh, so I was always a bit problematic in that regard. <laughs> um, but when teachers and head teachers saw the magic of the effect that I could have with children, then that I kind of won the argument through the magical effect that I could have with children. Now, I, I, I never talked about these magical effects. I never said to a school, if you employ me and bring me in, our magic will happen with your children. Because of course, that's not flowing. That's killing the magic before you've even started. Because there's this expectation already of what's going to happen. And that, that spoils everything. I'm full of surprises. And um, I, I have these gorgeous musical instruments. I have my own gorgeous musical instruments that I will lead a musical workshop with, but I can take them in and do a drawing workshop for the children. And I'm casting a spell when they play my instrument. I don't say, I'm Mr. Baron, I'm going to cast my spell now and you're going to draw. I just do it. I ask the children, do they want me to keep playing? Have they had enough? Do they not like it? I'm always unsure that what I'm doing is welcome to them. It's always welcome to them because magic is happening. And I'm trying to get them to stop talking to each other, which is the natural way in little tables that children do. And I'm trying to stop them copying each other's work. That's the other normal thing that they might do. Just want them to draw what's in their heads, not worry about what things are supposed to look like, not an anatomical correct drawing. I want to know what's going on in their heads and how they can portray things because, oh, yes, it's a distortion from the natural world, but it's very interesting what children come out with. I was amazed in my drawing workshops because the children come out with the same things. If you did that workshop in 1960 or 70 or 80 or 90 or the 90s or 2010s, the children are in this world that doesn't really change. And, and the current things in the world, they might be in the drawings, but that's not the thing. It's the same things that they're thinking about, the same images. I found that really fascinating. Uh, that children, that that's what's going on. I would have thought that the current thing would be what they're obsessed with, what would come out with the page, but it's not at all. Uh, I've got lifetimes now, collected children's drawings. I, you can't tell the difference between the first lot and the last lot, really. You can tell the difference in ages, for sure. Um, but I think children's drawings are magical. Uh, are always encouraged to uh, reproduce their drawings on things that I make. 
So you can see behind me on the bed head, I've kind of done this with Miriam. I've taken images that are important to her uh, and drawn them. There's a three, three kind of spiral that goes together. That's from the triple headed moon goddess. There's her hand I've drawn around and drawn a hand of Miriam in there. So I've had my phone, our adult phone, in a childlike way in our bed. I've let in bellum nights in a pattern, an abstract pattern in the central beam of this bed. And over there is my images, my hand. And I've let in buttons and coins. You know, I'm really a big fan of the old coinage. Uh, the Boris promise was coming back and I bet it never comes back. Because people are groaning and going, oh God, I can't cope with two coinages at once. It's hard enough dealing with one. Uh, but I love the old coins. I love playing with them when I was a kid. It connected me to everything. It connected me to the whole world connected me to everybody who'd ever handled those coins. Um, and I buy them now in the antique shops and I let them into the things that I make. And they're beautiful, they're gorgeous. Um, and yeah, Britain, Britain has these two histories, the horrible colonial power that ruled the world and the wonderful colonial power that helped everybody in little ways, not so little ways. Britain had this kind of civilizing effect that it was trying to do. I know it was colonial and it used its power in the worst way and it made tons of money out of slavery and trading. But it did, there were a lot of good things done as well. And it was a trading empire. So there was all this merchant seamen and ships and exploring the world and, and self-interest and trying to find things that they could, Britain could manufacture and then not foist on the rest of the world, but the rest of the world could benefit from slightly. We're still in that same place today because Britain is perfectly capable of making modern state-of-the-art things that are really necessary that the world needs to cope with climate change. Britain could produce and manufacture all kinds of products and services that people need and, and could offer the rest of the world who desperately need. Everybody's running out of water. Everybody's having to deal with a polluted environment and sea. And Britain could, could just thrive on solutions, not just solutions for Britain, because Britain itself is in trouble in all kinds of ways. But for the whole world, Britain could be leading the way if it only had a government that could help facilitate this. And there's a phrase that came out of my lifetime called necessity is. And that's what is coming, that ne the necessity of solving those kinds of problems will force these solutions that are beyond people's dumbo uh, imaginations at the moment. And the point of making beautiful pergolas of transformation is to produce the next generations who are gonna do this work, who are gonna live in this world that's falling to pieces and necessity is to take the solutions to those problems. So I love that school. I write to them every so often saying, you should have more of my work there. You should have me there back playing. Now, Mary Overall, she's been at home. She's probably dead now. Um, she's not there, but I would find somewhere to stay in the vicinity and be in that village. Uh, they talked about getting some of my musical play inside that pergola, but of course, the head teachers, they change over the years. The priorities change. The magic of Mr. Barron is not remembered because all those children would have gone on now. Um, but anyway, that's there. And it changed me. It changed the way that I thought about working in schools um, and what, what the possibilities are working in schools. 
and how wonderful the children are. And there's nothing to be afraid of. They're not going to run off in all directions with all your tools at once. Uh, they're not going to create those kind of problems. The problems are going to be at the other extreme of how well behaved and under control they are um, and how scary that is. Um, anyway, that's my story about Great Milton. It's not the whole story because, because of the success of that pagla, uh, that led into another amazing job in Great Milton. Great Milton, this quiet little village where you think nothing ever happens, but amazing things have happened for me there. Uh, I have a number of places around the country like this, like Wrexham, Wrexham in North Wales, which is a very working class industrial kind of a place. Uh, you wouldn't think that exceptional things could happen, but exceptional things happen to me in Wrexham. And I hope that I get to a, a Zoom ramble and talk about them one day. But that's the end of this Zoom ramble for now. And thank you for listening.